Hello, everybody. Warm greetings from the American University of Beirut campus in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm truly delighted to welcome you all to an exciting new mentoring talk, our first of 2022 and 23rd overall. Today's mentoring talk by Professor Jeff Karp is a very special one. As many in the audience are sure to be pre-med or medical students, you will find the contents of this talk to be specially relevant. I accidentally saw a post that Professor Karp made in early 2018 about his appointment as full professor at Harvard Medical School after he had been rejected as a medical student to the same school in 1997. That post, in fact, went viral, and I tweeted about it on March 8, 2018. Since then, I had Professor Karp on my list of inspiring mentors to invite to this platform. Like many in the healthcare field, Professor Karp originally aspired to become a physician. When life didn't take him down that particular path, he forged another destiny for himself. Today, he is a distinguished biomedical engineer and a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Quote, jump towards opportunities even if you fear them, end of quote says Dr. Carr, perfectly encapsulating the message behind our mentoring talks initiative. As many may know, we have been regularly hosting influential speakers from different walks of life to deliver life advice to our students and community at large. These talks highlight the speaker's academic and life journeys reminding the community that success does not happen overnight. Our speaker, Professor Karp, is a laureled researcher involved in cutting edge endeavors. He works in coordination with many university hospitals, in addition to several laboratories pursuing innovative biotech that could change the world. But, Moreover than simply listing his accolades, we want to emphasize the unique perspective our esteemed guest brings to the table. In going from a medical school reject to professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, Professor Karp truly embodies the transformative approach to education that the mentoring talks endorses. In his own words, empower yourself through getting in touch with the chemistry that excites your brain and jump towards opportunities even if you fear them. Without further ado, I shall leave the floor to Professor Karp to tell us his story. Jeff, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. And can you see my slides? We can. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much uh, for that nice introduction and uh, for inviting me to uh, to speak here today. Um, and <clears throat> what I, I thought I'd do is is share not just some of the projects that we're working on in the lab. Um, you know, a lot of them are translational in nature. We're trying to figure out how can we um, uncover new insights to enable us to um, develop technologies that can 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 help patients as soon as possible, but really to kind of get into some of the um, the process behind the evolving process um, behind that work. Um, and um, before I start, uh, I do need to disclose some conflicts of interest uh, of which I have many. Um, so I have started a number of companies. And uh, these companies, uh, many of them have been uh, spin outs from my, my laboratory. Um, I own equity in these companies and uh, I'm also actively uh, consulting for these companies as well. So where I thought I would start is really just um, some core aspects of my laboratory, 
I spend a lot of time in self-reflection and thinking about um, uh, the process, the process behind pretty much everything and how can we continue to evolve that process in meaningful ways um, so we can, can really maximize uh, momentum and an impact. And where this all really starts is in how do we recruit people to the laboratory um, uh, to really form a cohesive environment where um, we can, can work on the beginning stages of, of innovation. And, um, you know, I've always kind of thought, you know, it'd be great to try to figure out how can we recruit people who are driven to change the world, who really get along well. And I've realized that that's actually a lot easier said than done. Um, there's many challenges to, um, to populating a laboratory um, with the right phenotype of people um, to, uh, to really bring on maximal impact and, and innovation. And just a couple of thoughts um, that I've, I've wanted to share with you. One is that I've realized kind of over time that I'm not really the best judge of character. And, and you know, I, I feel like when, when people apply to the lab, it's like I want to say yes to everybody. Um, and, you know, my brain kind of looks for ways to do that. Um, and, uh, and so what I've, what I've found is um, that there's certain people in the laboratory who are really exceptional at, at, at helping us to figure out, um, you know, who should, who should join. And so I make sure that they're part of every hiring decision. And in fact, I've kind of created a, um, a hiring committee in the lab and they actually have veto rights over me. So, for example, if they think somebody, um, you know, shouldn't come to the lab and I think they should, then, then, you know, their decision really holds. And, 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 and so to me, that's really important. And then another thing um, that I just have found interesting is that I read this article uh, a while back that said, when you're trying to um, hire people and recruit people, you tend to, to hire yourself. And that really um, struck me. And the next time I was interviewing people for the laboratory, I, I was thinking about this and realized that actually I was evaluating them based on my own kind of strengths and weaknesses. And, and that's why I think it, it is so important to engage other people in the um, in the hiring process. Um, and so this has been been really, uh, really critical. Um, another thing that that I found is 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 how important it is to try to um, really focus my efforts on finding ways to empower people um, with uh, with resources and opportunities. And I'll just give you an example, um, just one one of many that I could give. Um, so we had a a very talented um, graduate student in the lab um, uh, back a few years ago, Ben Mead. And um, in his first year, he said to me, you know, I'd really like to write grants um, and, you know, really get in, into that process. And so we started writing some um, grant proposals together and a number of them got funded. Um, and so he said, well, what, what should we do now? And I said, well, okay, well, you have to hire a team. And so I helped him to, to hire uh, a few people. And so when he was in his second year of his um, graduate degree, he actually had um, three or so uh, full-time people in the lab who were reporting directly to him. And this was really you know, a wonderful thing because it allowed him to develop his mentorship um, skills very quickly um and uh, and really flourish and and then um one of the grants was from a foundation and they asked me to come and give an update talk um and uh, and i knew that if i asked them if ben could join me they probably would say no or there was a chance of that so i just brought ben into the room with me um and i started presenting the first few slides and then i handed it over to him um and uh, later at the reception that the um the board members were just really impressed with, with Ben. And, and again, that really helped to, I think, empower him and, and um, you know, to help develop his, his um, network and, uh, and, and various skills like his presentation skills. And so I'm always looking now for ways to empower people um, and in, in, in ways so they can really spread their wings and really have the steepest growth curve possible. I'm always trying to think about you know, everybody has enormous potential. How can I help 
in the process um, to unleash that potential, to be really just provide guidance so that they can, can realize that potential. And another thing that I've tried to do is I have multiple affiliations in Boston um, at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, at Harvard Medical School, at MIT, um, at the Broad Institute. And I really see this as, um, and something that I've, I, you know, there's so many resources in Boston, but you have to be able to, there's like an activation energy that you have to overcome to really um, leverage all of these resources. And it's it's not like a, a linear path. And so what I realized is by having a lot of affiliations, that kind of got my foot in the door to um, forging um, collaborations and accessing core facilities. And so to me, I, I when we're developing something in the lab or working on a project, we wanna have minimal barriers. And so I found that just having multiple affiliations really reduce the barriers to accessing what we need to access, whether it's um, you know knowledge um, or ideas um, from collaborations or resources in terms of, of um, you know, core facilities. And then um, in addition to that, um, we've had, I would say, people from over 30 countries in the lab, um, and then also probably even more disciplines. I mean, we've had a gastrointestinal surgeon, a cardiac surgeon, a dentist, multiple types of engineers and biologists, some material scientists, um, and it's constantly changing. And the way I kind of think about that is if we're around a, a table, let's say, and we're brainstorming, um, we want to have minimal overlap in expertise so that everybody can provide a unique perspective. Everybody, um, you know, people from different countries, um, there's different education systems, so they think differently, they have different instincts, they even have different problems that might affect their country. And so um, that, that, you know, having awareness of that, you know, kind of opens up the potential opportunities to us, not just for ideas, but, but actually things that we might want to focus on. Um, and when you have minimal overlap of the expertise of people, let's say when you're brainstorming, everybody can feel um, validated because they're providing a unique perspective that others can't um, provide. And they have ideas of tools and things in their discipline um, that they can contribute to the conversation. So I, I found that to be very helpful. Um, and then I also have learned from my um, previous mentors, how important it is to commit to being a mentor for life. Um, so anyone who joins my laboratory, um, whether it's, you know, high school student to, um, you know, perhaps even a, a visiting professor, for example, like I, I, I think it's just so important to, to commit to not just being a mentor when they're in the lab, but actually when they, when they leave as well in terms of writing letters and providing guidance or advice and just, just always being um, available so that the community is not just sort of the lab community, you know, in a particular city, but it, it's, you know, constantly growing and, and evolving. And, and, um, and I found that to also, you know, when people know that you're going to commit to being a mentor for life, they're also more willing to give it their all and, and it kind of removes um, some barriers. So, in addition to kind of just telling you a little bit about the general strategy of the lab, I wanted to share um, some thoughts of the translational strategy in terms of, um, you know, how, how do we think about working on projects that can um, not just lead to new insights, but also can potentially move to patients as quickly as possible. And <clears throat> so one of the things that we try and do early on in projects is put on our detective hats and sort of make this assumption that all the previous assumptions and, and things that we know about problems are wrong. So the, the problem definition is, is really the initial place that we start. And we make the assumption that the way that the problem has been defined is completely wrong. Now, it might be right, but by assuming initially that it's wrong, that um, really motivates us to, um, you know, look under every, you know, really examine every um, assumption uh, and, and cut through the ones that exist in the field, really trying to like prove to ourselves um, that uh, that that the problem has been defined in a way that that we think is is um, you know approaching the the truth. And often when we do this, when we start sort of trying to define the problem, we realize 
um, that there are holes in in maybe thinking about like certain assumptions or um, sometimes we sort of backtrack like we look at references and we go back and back and back and then we realize that there was some like obscure thing that someone said in a poster presentation and the whole field has been now referring to this but it it's not rigorous and so um, you know these these give us ideas for early experiments um to uh and and this this kind of approach has been been really helpful for us another thing that we do and <clears throat> i like to do this in pretty much um all of my um, lab meetings is ask the question of what's the bar that we must exceed to get people excited um to get our colleagues excited you know fellow fellow scientists and engineers people in the community potentially investors or or others in in pharma companies or biotech companies so in other words, you know, it's almost like saying, what's the best result anyone has ever achieved in a particular model? Um, and how much better do we need to do in order to claim, you know, um, a success, to claim, you know, maybe an early victory or, or some sort of, you know, um, that, that we have advanced, move the needle, um, you know, for the field. And, um, to me, it's just so easy in science to focus on things that are incremental and, and trying to, you know, often you'll see science presented in a way where it's like, you know, here we, we tested this and here's the control and the control is here and our response is way up here and look how great this result is. But then when you start comparing it, let's say, to the gold standard that's used in medicine, you realize um, that the result is is really not um, not not anywhere near where it needs to be, and so it's kind of like really thinking deeply about um, about importance early on. Um, so, what's an important result that we could achieve that would get people excited? So, you know, for example, if we want to sort of drill down on this just a little bit, we might say, okay, if we're doing work on some sort of targeted nanoparticle approach or, or something, let's say, to try to move the needle for cancer therapy, and we look in a particular mouse model, we may say that, or we may see when we examine the literature, that the best result is achieving, you know, survival for 100 days, and, and you know, it's like, 40% of the animals survive for 100 days. And so we might look at that and say, okay, you know, if we could get 60% or 75% of the animals to survive that long, then, you know, that potentially would be the best result um, that has ever been achieved in that model system. And then that makes us, that's kind of like our, our goal is to try to achieve that result. Um, you know, and there's all sorts of different ways to define it, but again, it's really like digging deep in the literature, understanding what's the best result in a particular model and how much further do you need to go. And, and this has really been um, just incredible way for us to try to define whether we're achieving impact or not. And then the other advantage of this is that when you submit to journals, if you can define that bar for, let's say, the editors, you know, they're more likely to send the paper out for review if you can 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 argue that you have actually moved the needle um, for the field. The other thing that I spent a lot of time doing is trying to figure out, you know, I, I, I've um, ha had some really or have some really incredible mentors who are um, excellent at translating technologies from academia to um, to to patients. But, you know, coming out of my postdoc, um, I had seen others do it, but I'd never really done it myself. And I realized that I just didn't have the, the um, intuition and I didn't have, um, you know, the, the, the knowledge of, of how to do this. Um, and so I knew I wanted to try to figure out how we could develop technologies and bring them to patients quickly. Um, and so what I did was I decided early on every two to three weeks to try to meet somebody um, in the ecosystem who have different skill sets that I have. Um, you know, maybe it was like a patent lawyer or a corporate lawyer or someone in a pharma company or a biotech company, medical device company, um, perhaps like, like a um, regulatory expert or a reimbursement expert and just meet with them and, or a manufacturing expert and, and just meet with them and try to develop relationships. And so over time, I was able to um, connect with a variety of people with completely different skill sets than than I have, 
And this was really helpful because as we're now advancing projects in the lab, it's almost like I have this informal advisory board where I'm reaching out to people and asking them, <clears throat> you know, things like, do you think this could be manufactured? Or um, another question that we asked that I think is just really important to consider early on um, is what would the clinical trial look like? What, what would, um, what's the gold standard that we would be comparing to? Because if we can figure that out early on, we we'll probably want to include that in some of our early experiments in the laboratory to show how we're doing compared to that gold standard, you know, are we way below it? Are we about the same level? Are we higher? You know, that that's important to know. So I call this, you know, developing and applying translational filters. Now, by having these, um, you know, interactions with people in the community who have these skill sets I don't have, um, I'm now able to ask questions like, can do you think this could be manufactured? Is it too complicated? Um, and then we can then make changes or tweaks to the technology in the laboratory to then maximize the potential that, you know, we're checking those translational boxes. Um, and then, um, you know, and then getting feedback all along the way. Um, you know, it's interesting. I read this article um, a while back um, about Pixar, the, um, you know, the animation company. And um, the title of the article was going from suck to non suck and essentially it was all about how Pixar early on in their strategy would, um, you know, make a, a movie and then they would show it to test audiences and the test audiences would, um, you know, have a lot of negative negative things to say about it and then they had to then go back and make changes. It was really expensive and, and a long process. And so what they did is they completely changed their strategy so that <clears throat> they would show to focus groups all along the way and they found that this was a much more efficient and effective way um, to go and, and i feel like that's what i've tried to do in my laboratory as well is that you know when we get ideas it's easy to just get really excited about the ideas and just start to run um, but often the ideas or or you know what we're thinking there's a lot to holes and so by engaging people with with um, expertise in areas we don't have we're able to identify some of those holes and then you know try to address them head on um, early on in our experimentation. And then um, I'd say in addition to that, we try to um, publish in the best journal we can. Um, and, uh, and, and I also work to develop a relationship with the communications office at my institution. So, you know, when it makes sense, <clears throat> we can do a press release um, on the technology. And there's also been a number of companies then who might see that press release and then contact us. And so that can help with translation. Um, and then the model that I have really tried to, um, or, or I guess has, has really worked best for me is um, in, in addition to applying those translational filters by engaging people in the, the ecosystem, I've also gotten to know some entrepreneurs and, um, you know, people who have started companies are CEO of companies or, or, or have other positions. And so what I try to do is as a technology is getting more mature in the laboratory, look to partner with an entrepreneur um, and then to bring this out of the lab and start a new company where that entrepreneur, um, you know, often will become the CEO uh, of that of that company. Um before you even finished, uh, there are uh, so many questions are already in the Q&A box. Sure. Um, I don't know how long. Uh, uh, what about, uh, because the students have so many questions to ask you. Um, I don't know how long you um, you plan to uh, speak. If you want me to interrupt with questions, like you suggested yeah, yeah, at the beginning. Questions right now. That, that would be great. Okay. So, um, we have many, many questions. Um, <laughs> So I have here, uh, you are known to find solutions to scientific problems. Which problems did you fail in solving? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. This, is, uh, this question, sorry, is from Joanna Haddad, who's a psychology pre-med uh, student here at AUB. Yeah, I would say, I mean, failure is something that we encounter um, a lot. And um, <clears throat> I would say, you know, we, we, we fail um, in a lot of what we do, um, but to me, it's more about kind of redefining failure. So failure often is not the end of the road, the end of the project. It's more, 
we, and you know, it's often like failure is you have an expectation of how things should go and then they don't go that way. And then, you know, you kind of get, <clears throat> uh, um, you know, it, it feels like a setback and, and um, it's, you know, ends up being a difficult um, time. But then what we have found is that in that opportunity, sometimes what we can do is say, okay, well, well, is there an expertise here that we're missing? Is there somebody we could bring into this collaboration or this project who might give us um, or present new ideas? And so we'll, we'll then start to look around and see, okay, like maybe we should bring in this expert chemist or this material scientist or this biologist. And um, then we start having conversations and we start realizing that there are certain elements of the biology or the chemistry that we hadn't considered um, and then this provides a whole new um, direction for the project. And so while what we initially thought was um, going to work didn't work, we then get really excited after that failure because um, now we have a completely new direction that seems much more promising and and then we just go for it. And so I would say, you know, it's like every single project is like that. Um, there, I'll just give you one example. We, we were developing a, um, actually we were working with a group that had gone around to a bunch of neonate units um, where they're caring for, um, you know, premature babies. And they had asked them, what's one of the biggest problems that you face? And one of them was um, adhesives on the skin to adhere tubes and monitoring devices and things. And when you take them off, because the skin is so fragile, it just tears the skin. And so we got some funding <clears throat> to advance a project in this area, actually from um, the light bulb company, Philips. Uh, they had a medical ventures group. And um, our initial idea was to develop some sort of adhesive that then you would put enzymes, like uh, some sort of substrate in it. And then when you were done using it, you would put enzymes on top and it would just degrade and then you could take it off the skin without damaging it. And we made some, you know, interesting advances, but then we just realized it was far too complex and um, was going to be too costly. And um, <clears throat> we were so, so we were kind of, you know, a little bit down about that because now, you know, what are we going to do? And somebody in the lab, Brian Wallach, who was a postdoc um, at the time, came up with this idea of like, you know, well, what if we could make it simpler by learning from spider webs and how when when you're walk when a spider is walking on its web there's regions that are sticky and regions that are not sticky and we could make this kind of pattern middle layer um, to be able to remove the backing layer which is the most robust part of a, a bandage away just leaving the adhesive on the skin and then you could pull the tubes through the adhesive and and that actually ended up working and so um you know that that um you know so it was almost like one of these things where it was you know how we initially thought of the project um, we had this expectation it would work, but it didn't. But then because we're just constantly thinking about other ways of doing things and potentially bringing in um, uh, new collaborators, we're able to then figure out another path um, that might be different from what we, we initially envisioned. So, so thank you. This question is from Rain Obaid. The title that you chose for your mentoring talk, empowering yourself through getting, and uh, that's uh, that's not the title, uh, Rain. Uh, that's the quote. The quote that you have in your mentoring talk poster, empowering yourself through getting in touch with the chemistry that excites your brain and jump towards opportunities even if you fear them. It's so inspiring. I would like to know what did it mean to you to be hired as a professor of medicine after being rejected as a medical school. At the, as a medical student from the same school at one point. How did that redefine your experience? I want to carry on. Uh, I'm a professor of organic chemistry. Um, I teach organic chemistry. Most of my students are pre-med students. And when they uh, don't do well in one exam, they think it is the end of the world. In fact, that's why I started all the mentoring talks in, since 2016. So for you, what did it mean to be rejected as a medical student at Harvard and then being appointed? And that was a powerful post that you made back in 2018 that you were hired as a professor of medicine. And I, you, at that time, I remember that you put the letter that you received from the dean of School of Medicine. And in that letter, it states you are hired as a professor of medicine in the... Uh, for for the rest of your life, 
right? It's, they yeah, meant yeah. with tenure, right? Indefinitely. The word they used, indefinitely, in that letter that you posted. So what did it mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I'd say thinking back, um, you know, when you apply to, uh, I mean, when you're, when you're kind of doing anything and you put a lot of work into it, a lot of thought, and you, you kind of get into that frame of mind that this is what you are destined to do and, and you really feel like you're going for it and then it doesn't happen, um, <clears throat> it's a very challenging moment um, in time because um, it's hard to see anything else. It's almost like, you know, always, I like to think of like, you know, when we're thinking about something, it's like we have this pen light and we're shining it on it. And so at this moment, you're just shining your pen light on that experience and you can't see anything else except that. Um, even though there's this entire, you know, infinite, you know, possibilities in the world that exist, you're just thinking of that one single, you know, thing. And, and I think what happened was, is that, you know, time was really important to, to, to me. And I think it, it's always been, a, you know, an important kind of tool, if you will, where, you know, you go to bed that night, wake up the next day, start thinking about it, still frustrated, trying to, you know, trying to figure out, okay, well, what am I going to do next? And I, I, you know, and, and I think what ended up happening was, is I started thinking, okay, well, <clears throat> what are some other paths? And I started to reflect on well, what really excites me? What are the things? And, you know, I wrote things down. So like, you know, what was it that I really liked in, in um, my, in high school physics, physics, I found really, really challenging, but I just, and I spent time after class with the teacher, but physics is all about problem solving. And I was like, you know, I just love solving problems. And, um, and so I started to think, well, um, you know, and I, I was in chemical engineering at the time. I didn't really like what I was learning per se, but I liked the problem solving aspect of it. And so I just, I just started to think, well, you know what? Um, I would love to be a doctor. I, I felt like that was really what was best for me. Um, but, you know, there's this whole other world that I just love and which is all grounded in problem solving. And so I started to think, well, what if I went and did a PhD in, um, in, in biomedical engineering? And um, I started thinking like, okay, but then what would my career path be after that? Well, maybe I could start developing medical devices and therapies that could help patients. And I started thinking, okay, well, then I could interact with patients. And so maybe I won't be a, a medical doctor, but I would still be able to live other passions that I have. And so that kind of transition started to happen. I started to go to some lectures and get inspired. And then that's how it all kind of kind of around thank you uh, one of the um, attendees is uh, uh, dr kamal badr he's associate dean of the medical education and every year he gives an orientation to pre-med students and he stresses that you guys need to look for alternatives and uh, he always encourages students to apply to other medical schools and to consider exactly what you just described going into a PhD in uh, uh, other fields that, uh, that deal with the medicine. There are many questions, so um, I'll give you a little time to go on and then we can uh, um, ask more questions. We can see uh, sure. your cat in the background, I think. Okay, sounds great. Okay, can go you, ahead. Can... All right, excellent. Um, and so, yeah, I also, um, you know, have been reflecting a lot on on why I think we often fail, or you know, why you know I think we have certain expectations um, about our experiments, um, but things don't actually work out. And how can we how can we really set things on um, you know a better path? And how can we um, you know encounter these challenges, but actually make it part of the process, not like the end of the road? And what I started thinking a lot about was how when we start, sometimes we do just basic exploration in the lab, like we want to learn something or we want to get into a new area and we just, you know, start asking some questions with no real translation in mind at that moment. And then I was thinking about the translational projects where we really want to try and help patients as quickly as possible. And I realized that the way you go about those projects is completely different. And often when we think we're doing translation, we're actually doing basic science. And just to give you an example of that, I think, you know, if we want to 
um, answer a certain question and we, we, we need to synthesize something new. If that synthesis takes, let's say, like 10 steps, um, that might not actually be translatable because if you go to translate that into a product, you have to do quality control at each one of those 10 steps. Now, it's not impossible to do and it might be worthwhile, but it's going to require a lot more time, a lot more investment, and it's going to be much higher risk. And so that might be worthy of doing to answer a question, a, a biological question or some other type of question. Um, but if now you want to translate that, you probably want to ask the question of how can you do that synthesis in two steps or three steps or one step? Like, is there a way to simplify this? And to me, that's one of the big differences between doing basic science and translation is the translation you're actually thinking about the practical things that you need to do in order to bring this to patients. And um, simplicity is really, really important. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I've realized is that when we define problems often in science, we think about, let's say, the biology problem or we think of the medical problem. Um, but what I realized is that that is very narrow thinking. And what we need to do is we need to think about the problem much broader than just the biology or the um, or the clinical side, the medical side, because there's also um, a patent problem. So if we can't get a patent on the technology, it's going to be hard to get investors who are interested. And so as we're developing a technology, we're also going to like Google patents and looking at patents that others have filed to see, you know, is there um, a space that we can um, sort of claim as our own, or um, is this just such a crowded area? It's going to be really hard to um, to, to get a patent there. Um, <clears throat> and then um, there might be like a, a manufacturing problem. So you know, as I mentioned, you know, you have to do quality control at every step. And so um, you know, it might be sometimes we've developed a technology, and then we go talk to manufacturing experts, and they just say like, there's no way to manufacture this right now. It's like this is ahead of the curve, and there's you know, we're gonna have to wait some time. And so that's good to know. If you know that early on, then you can sort of modify your approach to to ensure that you could just plug into existing manufacturing approaches. Um, the regulatory problem. So thinking about what the clinical trial is going to look like very early in the project. Again, you can try to figure out like what are the different groups, what are the comparators, and then and then use those early on. Um, also, investment problems. Sometimes investors have been burned in certain areas and they don't want to invest because it's just been like a almost like a graveyard of 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 biotech companies that have tried it something and it didn't work. Now that's not a reason not to do it. But it's good to know early on because, you know, that might sort of impact how you think about, um, you know, what you focus your time on. Um, and then also a sales problem in terms of like, what are the competing approaches and how is yours really differentiated? And, and um, so we try to think about like, so I think, you know, one of the key things I've realized is that when we define the problem to solve in the academic setting, we're thinking about all of these different aspects of the problem. And we're not necessarily going to solve all of them sort of simultaneously, but it's good to know about them because it can affect how we approach um, our science and, you know, kind of be sort of open to tweaking things so that we have potential to get a patent that, that what we're doing, we, we think that there is a path to manufacturing, that we are including the key comparator in the clinical trial early on in our experiments to show that we're doing better or the same, depending on the, you know, what the idea is. And then just one last thing I want to mention about this, which is, is just, I've <clears throat> learned this lesson multiple times with, uh, with patents, um, is that, uh, and I filed a lot of patents. I've worked with a lot of patent lawyers. And I used to think that when you file a patent, it, it's really just the idea, the concept, you know, okay, here's the device that we're going to develop. It's going to help with this surgery or with, with you know, and, uh, and then we just go file the patent. But what I realized is that the patent um, is, is not so much about the idea. It's actually about taking the idea and testing it and finding regimes where it doesn't work and where it works. And so, you know, for example, let's say, we develop some sort of technology and there's a variable that we're modifying and the variable, you know, could, could be, um, 
uh, it could be all kinds of things. It could be the release kinetics, you know, from like slow, medium, fast. I mean, it could be all kinds of different things. And so what happens is, is I imagine almost like this graph where we start with a variable, key variable, and you have it like, you know, zero and 0.1, 0.2, it's not really working well. And then 0 0.3, 0 0.4, then it works incredibly well. 0.5, you know, basically just stops working. And so, you know, like that 0.2 to 0.4 for that variable is where things work the best. And it was non-obvious that it was going to work best in that regime. And then that ends up being the core of the patent. The strongest part of the patent was <clears throat> not the 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 broad idea that you came up with, but actually the experiment that you performed to show where it actually works the best. And uh, and 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 to me that that just you know kind of learning that now we think about the patent strategy and then we'll, we'll conduct experiments based on that um, to define these ranges or regimes where the technology works best, but we also want to find where it doesn't work very well or or not at all. So I wanted to share with you um, <clears throat> one of the, the projects in the lab. This has been a longstanding project, um, actually goes back even before um, 2009 um, <clears throat> when I was doing my postdoc with with uh, Bob Langer at MIT, I started getting into the area of tissue adhesives. And, uh, you know, we published some some papers together. Um, and then in the summer of 2009, Dr. Pedro Del Nido, who's the chief of cardiac surgery at Boston Children's Hospital, reached out. And um, he was um, working with children um, and trying to seal holes in, in beating hearts, essentially um, these septal defects, so those holes right here in the septum. And he said, you know, sometimes I go to suture it and it's so fragile, it just tears. Um, and there's these devices that work well for adults, but you can't simply downsize them because um, the, the child's heart is growing and it'll just outgrow the, the device over time. So he said, is there any way we can work together? And so we started thinking, you know, how might we, uh, how might we approach this? <clears throat> and so we came up with this idea for a, a patch that we would put inside the beating heart, would attach to the surrounding tissue, immediately seal the hole, and then cells would migrate on top of it, form new tissue, then the material would degrade, and the patient now is left with their own tissue sealing that hole, which could then grow um, you know, with, the, with the child. And so we pretty excited about that idea, and we started um, you know, moving forward. Um, and then we just kept hitting wall after wall where, where we just, um, you know, nothing was working. And um, it's like what happens is, and, and I think this is kind of, you know, what happens in every project and going back to the question about, you know, failure. Um, you know, it's, when, when, when someone asks, you know, about describe a failure, I almost feel like every single project, there was a pretty substantial failure along the way. Um, and I think what happens is just kind of reflecting on this is often when we encounter a challenge or, you know, something doesn't work, we step back, we to get the team together, we think about it, um, and then we try again. But often, if you really analyze what you're doing, you're applying the same thinking, expecting different outcomes. And just to emphasize that, I wanted to show the following example it has nothing to do with medicine, but this, this really happened in Europe where um, here's this car that's fallen into the water. Um, you know, who knows how, <laughs> how that came about. But um, here we have the problem solvers um, lined up uh, to try to solve this. And they chose to bring in a crane. They probably had a few different ideas. And um, things um, seem to be going well until the following happens. So one problem is turned into two problems. And the second problem is bigger than the first. Something I'm sure you know that we all can relate I actually to. Actually, tweeted this, and it is it illustrates the situation in Lebanon. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you can apply this to uh, to many different problems in the world, um, and how problem solvers, you know, typically go about solving problems um, is you know you you try something, um, it doesn't work very well. Um, and then you just put more resources into kind of trying the same thing again, even though it doesn't look exactly the same, it's, it's using the same thinking. Um, and then you just keep encountering the same challenge over and over again. And in fact, what these problem solvers did is um, what I think all of us would do next. Um, if everyone would just think for a moment, what would you do next here to solve this problem? 
Now it's two problems, and that is to bring in a bigger crane. And what do you think happens? The same thing. So the challenge here is how do we break free from this repetitive process? Our brains like to operate in these low energy states where they anticipate what comes next, kind of like what I like to think about is like, you know, low energy brain state or robotic mode. It's like when you learn something, you know, that's kind of a high energy brain state, but then when you're just doing it over and over again, you go into this low energy state and um, it's like, you know, I've given talks before where I've memorized the whole talk and I can get up and give it. And I'm like thinking about something different while I'm sort of presenting because I'm like in this robotic mode. Um, or for example, you know, my kids play video games. And so if I try to play the games that they're playing, I do like horrible on it. But I realize is that like early on, I can't hold the conversation when I'm trying to play this video game. I just, I need to focus all of my attention. But then once I learn, I get past a certain point in the video game, it's like I can get past that every time while I'm holding a conversation with someone else. Like I can multitask on it because now it's like programmed in. It's like this robotic mode. And I think because our brains like to like to gravitate towards these low energy states, these robotic modes, I think we need to find ways to break free from that. And one of the ways that we do that in my laboratory, and there are a lot of ways to do it, is turning to nature for inspiration. And so this is really this concept that evolution is the best problem solver. Everything living around us exists because it has overcome insurmountable challenges. Um, and everything that's living has all kinds of problem solving stories to tell um, of how it survived to be here today or how it changed, how it adapted to be here today. And so I think we, when we encounter problems, you know, anywhere in life, but, you know, we're speaking today just about kind of more academic or translational problems, I think we can do is we can look at nature for inspiration to give us new ideas. And so for this idea of get, going back to um, sealing holes inside the beating heart, we ask this question, well, um, what creatures exist within wet dynamic environments, you know, in nature? And um, we looked at uh, sandcastle worms that exist in the sea, and then um, slugs and snails that, you know, are on the land. And sandcastle worms, you know, they're on a rock and the waves are hitting them, and they remain attached. And then slugs and snails, you may see like a snail sitting on a leaf and it's raining um, and, uh, and it's not moving, it's just stuck there. Sometimes you're walking across the ground, there's this kind of goo behind it. Um, and what we realize is these creatures have a couple things in common. One is viscous secretions. Um, things that are viscous stay put. Like if you put honey on a table, um, just kind of pour it on and then try to remove it with water, it takes time to wash away. So there's these viscous adhesive interactions. And, um, and the reason that we thought was interesting is because we thought, okay, well, if we develop a patch and we put um, a viscous kind of precursor, like a, a pre-polymer on it, that um, could be photo curable. We work with a lot of photo curable um, strategies in the lab. We could take this um, tape, this biodegradable tape with a biodegradable sort of viscous precursor of a glue, push it down um, around the, um, the hole um, onto the tissue and it would immediately attach so that the clinician could get it into the right site. Um, and um, Another problem we, we were thinking about is that there's blood, you know, in the heart, it's like filled with blood and every surface is covered with blood. So if we just attach it to the blood, um, that's not going to be good. And so what we learned is that these slugs and snails have hydrophobic components to these viscous secretions that can repel water. And so we thought, okay, well, what if we made our, our um, glue, this tissue glue hydrophobic so that it could repel blood away from a surface. And most of the tissue adhesives at the time um, were hydrophilic, trying to mimic the properties of the, the tissues. And so we made it hydrophobic and um, lo and behold, we were able to show that we could repel the blood away from the surface of the heart. And then by having it viscous, it allowed the clinician to put it down and kind of move it around so it didn't immediately wash away. But that didn't tell us how we can make this strongly adhesive because this needs to adhere very strongly to the heart. And so for that, we looked at ivy and uh, often, you know, if you walk around Boston or New England, you see a lot of buildings that have ivy on it. And um, if you try to go up and pull some of the ivy off, it, it's incredible the amount of force. 
So the mechanism that Ivy uses to do this is they have these root hairs that go up and down a surface and they look for crevices, like little gaps, and then they insert into the crevice and then they secrete a glue and then this dries and it mechanically shrivels and it interlocks. So that it, that's how it achieves strong levels of adhesion. And so we thought, okay, well, what if we made this glue so that as soon as you put it on the heart tissue, not only did it repel the blood away and it's viscous, so you know you have a, um, a tape behind it that you can then get in the right um, location. What if this glue infiltrated in the tissue immediately um, and then we shine light through the patch, which would then have to be transparent onto this glue that's now infiltrated into the tissue and light can go into tissue, you know, tens of microns, maybe 50 microns, 100 microns, and then we could cure that glue um, in the tissue so it would mechanically interlock. And so we were able to, to actually do this um, after multiple iterations. It took us a lot of tries to get it to work, but here we took the glue, we put it on heart tissue, um, it went into the heart tissue, um, which, and then uh, we cured it with the light, um, we freeze fractured it, and then we looked at it under the electron microscope. And so here you can see the, the glue here, the adhesive. Um, and uh, this is the collagen down below in the um, uh, collagen fibers in the, the heart tissue. And you can see that the glue is like interdigitated in between these fibers. Um, and so then what we did is we moved to one of the most challenging experiments we'd ever performed in the laboratory, which was, could we um, seal a hole in a beating heart. Now, this is um, an experiment that involved an animal. Um, and so the, I'm going to show you there's a bit of blood here. It's a surgery. So if anyone is kind of squeamish or, or uncomfortable with seeing um, animal experiments, you this is the time you probably want to um, look away. So what we did here was um, here you can see this is a, a, a dermal biopsy punch that we used. Um, and we made a pretty significant hole here um, in the rat heart. We have this suture that we're going to remove. We're just holding it there for the procedure, you know, just for experimental purposes. Um, and then we're going to attempt to take our patch, which is a completely new material we had to develop as well, transparent, biodegradable, and elastic. We have a thin layer of the glue that we developed on the underside. Um, and so there's the patch there. Um, the glues on the underside in between the patch and the tissue. We shine light here for five seconds. Um, but this animal actually something went pretty wrong. Uh, the patch kind of slipped. We made it, I think, a little bit too small. And so while it attached that you can see here, there was a big hole and um, we're trying to figure out what to do next. So we were kind of freaking out. We scrounged up as much glue as we could get on the spatula. We weren't prepared for this to happen, so we had to act quickly. And we just put the glue directly onto um, the hole. And if you look carefully, you'll see that it's less red here. So because it's hydrophobic, it's repelling the blood away. Because it's viscous, it stays in place for another pulse of light. Uh, and we end up with the perfect cell. Um, and it was about six months, and they all did fine. Um, so, again, proof of concept experiment, um, but we were pretty excited about the result. And so we moved to an even more challenging experiment, which is would this work in a pig model? And could we, instead of just putting this on the myocardium, the outside of the heart, could we attach this inside a beating heart? And so for this, <clears throat> what we did is made an incision here in the myocardium. We put this um, device in, pushed it up against the septum, shined the light. Um, and then remove suture at the myocardium. And then here you can see um, two separate pigs. Here's a patch and here's a patch. Um, and uh, they you know, remained attached immediately after the, the procedure. If, if they weren't attached, they kind of be moving all over the place. And then we came back after four hours, um, added epinephrine to increase the heart rate. And here you can see um, the patch is attached here on the left and also on the, on the right. And then we came back after, um, 24 hours, a lot of beats of the heart um, in that time. Um, and you can see the patch here. Um, here's the suture, which is part of the deployment mechanism of this uh, device that Dr. Del Nido had developed. Um, and then there, here you can see um, there's a, a clot that's forming over the um, material. And so again, this is just a proof of concept experiment. Um, you know, we need to do a lot more work to advance this to the clinic. Um, but this was very encouraging that this adhesive could actually work 
um, inside a beating heart, you know, a heart that's filled with blood with a lot of forces, um, expansion, contraction cycles, and the, you know, constant flow of blood over top of it. And um, this project, just to pause for a moment, um, was co-led by um, Nora, um, who's a cardiac surgeon based in Germany, and um, who was in Dr. Del Nido's lab, and Maria, um, who's a material scientist um, from Portugal, who was in my lab. And um, these two, you know, people with diverse um, skill sets uh, came together and, and were just excellent in, um, you know, a lot of synergy in co-leading this project. And then we were able to get um, regulatory approval for the glue component of this because this concept of sealing holes inside a beating heart is, is really challenging and there's so much work to do. We continue to advance that, um, but the glue alone is useful in medicine, we think, to seal all kinds of tissues in the body. And so um, we were able to get a CE mark, which is regulatory approval for a medical device um, using this glue to seal um, blood vessels. So we have this now in, in Europe and a US trial will be started um, soon. And then the company that we started is called Tissium and they've developed all kinds of devices. So this can be now sprayed onto tissue here. I've added a blue dye so you can see it. This is being placed in the middle here under water with a vacuum assisted device. So now you can place this in, in very you know, wet environments with this device. And then um, here are minimally invasive um, approaches. So you can um, pass this through um, trocars or you know, large needles to deploy this um, at various sites in the, uh, in the body. And, uh, and so I, uh, oh, and then um, they, they set up a large manufacturing uh, facility outside of Paris. This company is based in, in, uh, in Paris to see them. So I was giving a, a talk on this uh, technology at the New England Aquarium, and here's like the penguin exhibit um, behind me, and here's the audience. Um, and uh, the penguins were actually quite noisy um, because, you know, there's loudspeakers in their home. Um, and hard to see them, but there's a bunch over here. Um, and it was really a challenging talk for me to give because it was just so noisy with the penguins, and I had to stop multiple times. And I was worried that no one would hear me. Um, and luckily, um, Dr. Bill Rosenblatt um, in the audience heard me. He's a uh, um, an animal doctor, veterinarian, um, and um, he um, does a lot of work with craniofacial uh, procedures um, at a, a veterinary hospital in, in Boston. He said, oh, I think your glue could be useful um, for um, dentistry and, and craniofacial procedures. So we kept in touch. And he reached out to me um, a few months later and said that he has a patient um, that's a bulldog that was 10 years old and had a hole from the oral cavity to the nasal cavity. And he had done three surgeries to pull some tissue over top of it and it just failed every time. And we said, well, could we fill the hole with your glue, cure it, and then pull the tissue over top of it and maybe your material could take on some of the mechanical load so it wasn't all on this tissue that they had kind of cut. It's called a flap, a tissue flap. Um, and, uh, and so we were really excited to work with him and do this. Um, so we decided to move forward. Um, here's the hole in the oral cavity. This animal was not doing very well, kind of had stopped eating um, and um, really no, no options left. Um, and here you can see it's red here because this tissue had been cut to pull over the hole, but it kept so there's so many forces in this dog's mouth that just kept tearing. Um, and so um, what we did is we went in and we um, delivered the adhesive here after removing all the debris that area. Um, so we, we put multiple layers of the tissue glue here, cured it. Um, we cut under here um, to create a tissue flap and then pulled it over top. Um, so you can see that here. Um, so the glue is now hardened underneath this in the hole, and then this is the tissue on top of it. Um, and then uh, the animal went away, came back three weeks later, um, and Dr. Rosenblatt kind of wrestled with it to open its mouth and uh, looked inside and was really excited to see that the tissue flap was still in place. It had actually failed within a few days in three separate you know, prior surgeries, uh, but here it had worked for a few weeks, still early, but, but encouraging. This ended up working for quite a long period of time, um, and uh, and I wanted to um, show you the key data that we were able to generate um, for this experiment, which is a before and after picture. So here's um, the dog before the procedure um, was very unhappy that you can see here, and then after the procedure with our our glue, 
you can see he's extremely happy um, with the outcome. And uh, his name was Poppy um, or Little Poppy. And the owner had named him because um, he was really a big baseball fan in Boston. We have a, a team, the Boston Red Sox, um, uh, which, uh, you know, if you don't like baseball, you come to love baseball um, being in Boston uh, just because everybody's into it. And they had a player called um, uh, Big Poppy. And so the, uh, the owner had, had named the dog after this uh, Red Sox um, slugger who was known for getting, you know, lots of uh, home runs. And then the uh, media got wind of this and showed up and, and um, you know, was really excited about this story. Now it was just an N of one. So we had just, um, you know, had, had, had kind of saved a dog um, with this um, technology, but it ended up being really um, an interesting opportunity for all of us um, because um, I then got to go and do grand rounds at an animal hospital in Boston to present, which basically means you go and present a talk at like seven in the morning to the doctors there. And, um, and this has now led to another project um, where we're taking a technology in the area of uh, a new cancer treatment um, that we're now um, testing on, um, on pets. And so, um, yeah, maybe I'll pause there and see if there are, um, if there's any questions. Uh, there are, uh, thank you. There are plenty of questions. I don't know how much time we are already uh, over one hour. Okay. I suggest that we entertain the questions right now, but you clearly showed the audience that um, though you have been rejected to be accepted as a medical student, you have been an asset to um, a lot of medical problems to your colleagues around uh, um, in Harvard and MIT and beyond. And uh, that's a testament that uh, nothing can uh, stop you guys from reaching your goals. So um, with that, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to start questions. Let me go from the beginning. Okay. So here I have a question from Mahmoud al Hajj, um, biology junior student. He's thanking you for the inspiring talk. His question is, uh, what is your most significant innovation? I think he already showed you, but uh, I'll leave uh, the floor to you, Professor Karp. Yeah, I think, um, well, in terms of innovation, you know, first of all, I, I would say, um, you know, I like to think of innovation as something that you can only describe retrospectively. So meaning that, like, to me, innovation, I've thought a lot about this innovation, I think, means that you actually have to help somebody with your technology um, in order to be um, to be innovative. Um, and so, um, you know, which is really, I think, like an active definition. There's all kinds of definitions out there. And so I would say for the technologies that have actually helped people, um, well, the, the glue, the tissue glue has gone through um, trials in Europe, um, and it did help a number of people in those um, trials. Um, we also have a technology that we developed to try to restore hearing in people with hearing loss, um, and that's going through clinical trials right now, and a number of patients have had um, positive responses where their hearing improved. Um, and uh, we also have, you know, other um, technologies that, uh, that, that we've been working on um, that we hope to, uh, to really, um, you know, be useful in the near future. Um, uh, there's a needle that we developed that stops in between the layers of the eye to deliver gene therapy to the back of the eye. We're hoping to bring that to, to clinical trials in the next couple of years. Um, we also developed uh, a technology um, that uh, a lot of children, actually children swallow batteries, these small little coin cell batteries or button batteries, and then it gets stuck in their esophagus and it short circuits and can burn a hole right through their esophagus. And, and many kids have actually died from swallowing batteries. Um, and uh, it's actually, you know, if you Google it, you'll see a whole bunch of examples out there. Um, there's no solution for this, but we came up with a way so that when the battery encounters water, um, it will actually deactivate the whole battery so it, it can't get a current. Um, and um, we're now talking to a lot of the battery companies because we have advanced this to a scalable prototype so we can make this on a very large scale. Um, the technology appears to work, and so we're hoping this year to be able to you know, partner with a battery company to then bring that, bring that forward. Very nice. Uh, this is an interesting question. It's from Dana Osman, a chemical engineering student. Uh, I wanted to ask what impact did the Spider-Man illustration have on your career? 
Yeah, uh, actually had a lot of impact, <laughs> a pretty substantial impact, because um, what happened was I was um, doing my, when I was doing my postdoc at MIT, um, I was working in the lab late one night, just kind of looking around, um, you know, in my own mind, just, and I noticed a journal article on a colleague's desk that just had a picture of Spider-Man, and, and I was like, you know, kind of surprised about that because it was a nature journal. Um, so I just looked at what the article was and I, I went to my desk and I looked it up and the authors had um, had essentially figured out how geckos attach to surfaces and then made a synthetic tape and then their key figure in this nature paper was sticking a Spider-Man action figure to the ceiling um, with this um, gecko inspired tape. And so that opened up the whole world of bio inspiration to me and just got me really excited. And, and the first bio inspired kind of project that we worked on was trying to make a similar tape, but one using materials that would be biocompatible and biodegradable. So it could be like a surgical type tape. And so that, that actually, without that, I wouldn't be doing any work in the area of bio inspiration. So um, that was my sort of introduction to the whole space. Okay, nice, thank you. Um, this question is from Abdel Jalil Hajaj. What is your advice to applicants who did not get into medical school, but are still interested in pursuing medicine? I think that, um, that there's a lot of possibilities um, to, uh, to, to advance. I think, um, well, first of all, I think it's important to know that, that um, you're probably in the majority of people who apply to medical school don't get accepted at least the first time. Um, and <clears throat> I think that when you kind of look back at, at the data, um, what happens is, is that a lot of those people will end up doing something else for the next year or two, they'll reapply, um, but they might go and pursue another passion of theirs, like it could be research or, um, you know, could be, um, you know, they might go and, and do some volunteer work in a hospital and really get connected closely with patients. Um, and so I think essentially if you're really set on um, going to medical school, um, I think there's probably a lot of deep passion behind that in terms of helping people, in terms of being close with patients. And so I think that there's a lot that you can do to then demonstrate in your next application um, that you do have this deep passion, um, that you have not only that you recognize it, but that you're taking um, you know, steps to realize it. Um, and that could be, you know, by doing volunteer work or getting involved in organizations that could be, um, you know, helping patients, perhaps even, you know, in the third world um, or in, in sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, global health type things. So I, I think that to me is it would be important or, you know, taking courses, um, <clears throat> networking with with doctors and really trying to identify opportunities that um, will allow you to, um, you know, to experience aspects of your passion um, and that then you can put it on your, your resume, your CV next plan. Uh, thank you. This question is from uh, Dr. Sahar Kubar. Um, she is a nephrologist here at uh, UBMC. You portrayed yourself as a good mentor that lift your students up. What advice do you give to deal with bad mentors? <laughs> to deal with that. I'm not sure if this is coming from personal experience, Sahar. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, definitely. Um, I, you know, this is a great question. Um, and I think that, um, I think, <clears throat> well, first of all, I would say, you know, everybody should have not just one mentor, but, but several mentors. And throughout life, you know, as we evolve, <clears throat> you know, some of those mentors may stay with us for our whole life or some of them, you know, or we might just need to have new mentors at different stages. And I think that a mentor to me, so I think there's difference between, you know, a boss or, um, you know, somebody who might be, um, you know, your um, advisor, you know, not necessarily your mentor. Because a mentor, um, there's a lot of definitions, and one is one, one of the ones I really like is you know someone whose hindsight can become your foresight. So it's like they take their experiences and they want to share them with you so that they can kind of um, help you realize your potential 
by sharing the tortuous path they may have gone on, you know, and someone who was very raw might be kind of sharing the challenges and, and struggles that they went through. I think another aspect of a mentor is someone who really looks to empower you, who, um, you know, I think often bad mentor experiences are because the mentor may not be in touch with their ego um, and they might be guiding from a position of ego, meaning that, um, you know, they have this sort of fear about them. They don't want people to do better than them. They want to, you know, always be kind of putting themselves first. So they're not necessarily always creating a win-win situation. A mentor to me is someone who is really putting all of that aside and creating um, an environment that can really allow people to flourish, to um, you know, empower people. It's like someone who sees your potential and almost like treats you as if you're at that potential to help you realize it. Um, so I think my sense is, um, you know, sometimes if you have like a boss or an advisor and they're not necessarily the best mentor, you can seek mentorship from others who can then augment your mentorship experience. And, um, and, 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 you know, I've done that in the past where I just have, have connected with people who are just feel good to be around and they're, you know, have a lot to offer in terms of, you know, sharing their experiences and stories and, and providing guidance to me um, to help me through some, you know, challenging times that I, I've been through. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Suha. I don't have her last name. She is alumnus. Uh, apparently, she graduated a long time ago, according to her chemistry and biochemistry graduate. Uh, she's asking you to describe a regular day in your week. How do you spend your day? Name one good, uh, I think she corrected her question here, a good habit acquired and bad habit that you eliminated. Okay. Um, yeah, so my day is, I would say, often my days um, are are different, right, each day, but like maybe like the week is kind of similar. And then over a course of a number of months, I'll come up with something new and I'll just change like one big thing. So, you know, recently, for example, um, I have an exercise bike in my house. And so I've been getting up actually right behind me. Um, I've been getting up now at 6 a.m. and doing 20 minutes in the morning um, to get on the exercise bike. And in fact, you know, it's interesting, the other day I woke up and I felt tired and I was like, you know what, maybe I just need my sleep. And then I looked, I have this wearable that tells me how my sleep was and it showed that my sleep was actually really good. So I was like, ah, oh, my body's trying to tell me to go back to bed, but I know I had a good night's sleep, so I don't need to go back to bed. I'm gonna go, so kind of help me, motivate me to go on the exercise bike. So um, now I'm trying to do that. It's a new thing I just started kind of this week and I figure, you know, 20 minutes is, you know, doable, um, fairly intense. And then, um, you know, I, I'll just schedule like, you know, um, various uh, meetings, you know, with students or collaborators during the day, but I try hard not to schedule back to back things. Um, I really try to create space. Um, I didn't always do that. I used to do that. Um, I, 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 I used to just have back to back like all day long kind of earlier um, in my, my um, professorship. Now I try to create space because just I realized just freedom of thinking, freedom of thought is so important. Um, you know, I just notice myself walk, going for walks and always having my phone with me or listening to things and podcasts. And there's just so much like, there's so much demands on your attention and so much to learn. But I feel like, um, so I've tried to really carve out space in my day where I don't, I'm not, my phone's not on my mind. I'm just like, you know, I have no meeting. I'm just thinking and letting my thoughts kind of flow. And, and kind of getting out into nature if I can. Um, but uh, often, you know, scattered throughout the day and the week, there's meetings that are coming in and there's always things that are like unforeseeable, you know, challenges that arise um, or something urgent that needs to be addressed right away. Um, and so I think it's also important to have some space in your day so you can kind of get to things like that. And then also I, um, I've realized over time how important it is to um, to totally drop things um, for my family. 
Um, I didn't always used to do that. Um, but you know, like when my kids want me to go help, help them with their homework, or if they need to be driven somewhere, um, you know, in the past, <clears throat> I might have said five more minutes, like many times in a row. Um, but now I try to try to just stop whatever I'm doing and, and just try to be there, you know, with my, with my kids. Thank you. This question is from Rida Zou. I want to ask as a professionally accomplished researcher, how do you balance work and other aspects of life as your role in the world is very demanding? You kind of answered this right now. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's uh, it's such a big challenge because it's so, um, oh, it's so, I mean, there's communication these days with like text messages and, and emails. And, you know, so one of the things that I've done is I've turned off all my notifications for um, emails, basically every app that I have, I, I don't know, uh, text messages. Like if I want to look at a text message, I have to actually open it up and look, I don't get pinged about it. Um, and I know that slows some things down, but I just, it's one of the ways that I've tried to create more space, you know, for myself in the day and not be just chasing things immediately. A lot of things that I think are presented seem urgent, but they're not urgent. So I think I spent a lot of time thinking about what are the things that I really need to prioritize today? Um, it constantly changes day to day. Um, and I think, again, sort of carving out time, as I was mentioning, you know, just to have freedom of thought or to be able to just be there for my family. Now I, I drive my um, son to school every day. I pick him up. I take him to his football practice, um, you know, go pick him up, bring him home. Um, we live a little bit far from the school, so I do that. And on Tuesdays, I pick up my daughter from her school and take her, you know, whatever she wants to do. So, you know, I try to put things and I realize, like, yeah, actually, it, it, it just seems like robotic or mechanical or whatever, like to sort of put these things in your calendar. But I feel like <clears throat> in this day and age, there's so much gravity towards everyone wanting part of your attention for whatever it is, you kind of have to <clears throat> create these boundaries. And to me, one of the ways to do it is to put it in the calendar. Thank you. This question is from Lina Hajjadiab. Uh, she's majoring in nutrition. Uh, thank you for this talk. You surely inspired many. What about you? What, who inspires you to keep moving forward despite the challenges, failures we might face? Um, so I have some really incredible mentors. One is um, Bob Langer at MIT. And, um, <clears throat> you know, he is just um, such an incredible person on, on like every level I can think about in terms of the impact he's had for society, but just how good he's been as a mentor. Um, and just seeing how he's just continued, you know, over the years to, to be an incredible mentor and achieve so much impact through his work. He's co-founder of Moderna, um, with the COVID vaccine and, you know, all kinds of amazing companies, probably like 50, maybe more companies now. Um, so he's very inspirational. Um, I would say, you know, early on, I tried to maybe be like Bob too much. And I realized that I have so many kind of imperfections that it just, there's no way that I could get close to doing what he does. Um, he's just so fast at responding to things. And, and, um, and I realized that, you know, I really need to figure out what was best for me. Um, and that, so that was kind of really important, not just kind of seeing others and trying to mimic what they do. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, one of the, one of the kind of core examples, but there's so many, I think also just, you know, my colleagues are just so inspirational and, and part of it is, I think, you know, I'm curious about a lot of things. And so I try also to lead based on my curiosity and form collaborations with, um, people who I'm just very curious about their knowledge and their skills and them, you know, and so like, I'm always sort of interacting with people that I want to learn from and that I, I'm just inspired by. And I think that that really keeps me going. And then also just seeing other people translate technologies and help patients that know that it's possible to do it. I think once you realize that it's possible to do something and you realize that you can actually be part of a process to do something similar, um, I feel that's very like inspiring and empowering to to uh, to go for it. Thank you. This question is from Joanne Zreib. Uh, she's a biology pre-med student. 
Today, biomedical engineers are looking to the natural world to inform safe, sophisticated technologies. Um, that could help doctors treat patients more effectively. Why is nature such a good incubator for innovation? Yeah, I think um, I think one issue or one one consideration is that um, you know the process of evolution is just a problem solving process, and uh, and and um, I think that um, there's just um, you know I th I feel like you know we all come I, you know I've spoken to actually a number of like indigenous leaders and elders and and. Um, people who are, you know, just just have a lot of knowledge about the land and the earth and and nature, um, and um, and I think that you know we all come from the land. We all are going back to the land, you know, at some point, and um, and I think that uh, there's just this nature represents this incredible force that we don't completely understand, but we're actually part of it. And um, <clears throat> and I think that, you know, if you just look at like, you know, science, a lot of a lot of science is just trying to figure out how do we actually work, like how do different parts of our body work and, and just understanding, you know, all the things that we kind of take for granted, um, you know, it's just there's so much amazing complexity um, in nature, but then to think that we are amongst a web of of creatures and plants and there's just so much diversity and yet it's all working together within this ecosystem um and and i think that um i don't know when you when you get out and you start sort of thinking about these things um you just i think sort of come to this realization that there's just so much we can learn from nature and um so much to be inspired you know, by, by being in nature, um, you know, you just take like a single tree, right. And you start looking at it and you're like, Oh, I've seen this tree every day, but then you just start looking at it at different angles and you realize just the depth and, and, and just, you know, you start reading about it and trees are communicating with each other underground. And there's like, you know, certain types of like fungus that are, you know, kind of mediating this communication. And I mean, it's just unbelievable what, what, what nature is all about. And I just think there's so many lessons there for us to learn. There are still a few questions. Are you okay staying around 10 more minutes? You know, I do have something at 1230 um, that I need to jump to. I apologize, but um, yeah, so I do have like probably three more minutes if that's okay. okay. Well, Asman asked the same question about inspiration from nature. I'm going to just conclude with two more questions. Uh, this sure. is a very good question for pre-med students. Um, what is your advice uh, to students who want to go into medical school, um, but they want to get a master's degree before? What kind of master's degree do you recommend for a pre-med if they want to take um before joining the medical school yeah i think um <clears throat> well i think first of all it'd be good to, to talk talk to a number of people to get advice um you know because you want to <clears throat> i don't think any sort of one person necessarily is going to give the, the advice that i mean they might but like you know that's best for you um or that you know kind of suits you the best so that i think it's good to talk to a number of people um you know my answer <laughs> um it, is you want to do something that you're really passionate about um, and something that, um, you know, I think um, something that, uh, you know, I, I just maybe I'll kind of generalize this a little bit. I would say when making decisions about what to do next, um, one of the ways I like to think about it and when there's options to think about, okay, wake up in the morning, you know, imagine yourself like a year ahead or, you know, six months from now, whatever, in this position, you wake up, you go outside to go to wherever you're going, which position are you going to be most excited to go do? What are you going to be most fired up to do? Um, and, you know, if you're just going and doing, for example, like a master's to check a box um, because you think that it will be looked, you know, upon the right way for medical school, but you're not really excited about it, you know, my sense is that's probably not what you should be doing. Um, I think the world has changed so much from the way it was, you know, like decades ago where there was much more linear paths to do things. I think there's a lot more appreciation in the world, even in medical school for bringing people in who, with more diverse skill sets and expertise. And so I would say, 
you want to go do whatever it is that you are just going to be most fired up to do in that master's program. Even if it is not, if it is not medically related, you may want to just still go do that. And maybe you want to go and do some volunteer work on the side in the hospital to kind of, you know, keep showing your commitment and passion towards um, being a doctor. But I think that you really need to advance along the path of what you are most excited and fired up to do. Last question. Thank you for such an inspiring talk. When do you consider failure as a sign to turn a page and change direction? And when do you take it as a challenge to keep trying to achieve the same target? This is coming from Dr. Arij Marai. I'd say we uh, generally, we, um, we think about turning the page immediately and just saying like, we're done, this is it, <laughs> you know, we're gonna move on. Um, but when we give it a little bit more time, um, you know, the idea is that we don't want to sort of repeat the exact same process. Like we want to sort of think about a new way of doing it. And so that's why you know, maybe we might go out into nature, or we get some inspiration, talk to somebody new, and then tweak our approach. And so often, you know, maybe that one approach was a failure to achieve the outcome that we want to try to go for, like solving X problem. But maybe we just say, okay, well, maybe we can think of a different approach. And so, um, and then sometimes we'll take time in the lab and say, okay, well, maybe this just isn't the right time. We'll come back to this in several months or a year or two. We never really turn the page on a problem, but we might just turn the page on an approach to that problem. Thank you so much. On behalf of all attendees, I would like to thank you for such an inspiring talk and for staying with us uh, that long. I know how busy you are. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you again. And uh, for all attendees, thank you for hanging uh, uh, with us uh, that long as well. Uh, probably this is one of the longest sessions, but that's how much we were enjoying it. Um, until our next uh, mentoring talk, uh, so long. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And maybe someday I'll be able to visit. Uh, we look forward to hosting you here in Beirut. Yeah. Sounds great. Have a great day. Okay, bye thank bye. you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, bye-bye.